This is Tell Me Your Story. New paradigm is for a new world. I'm Richard Dugan, and I thank you so much for staying with us as we are talking with Tina Malia and Guru Ganesha Singh. Many things cross your mind. Take it easy. Got Tina, time. tell me about your spiritual path. Um, you know, I was raised fairly traditionally, mainstream America, suburbs. My parents are, you know, both... Christian based <laughs> religion. And um, when I was about 15, I just had just had this burning desire to find out all about not only different kinds of spirituality, but different kinds of, of music and just different paths. I, of course, you know, I was a teenager just becoming a young woman and I just, I wanted to know about everything. So I started reading about Hinduism and paganism and Buddhism and Judaism and Native American spirituality and, um, you know, everything I could get my hands on, really. Um, and and then that kind of coupled itself in, into music as well. And, and then, like I said, you know, learning different, different music from these traditions. And so music and spirituality to me are, are kind of the same thing because, as, as Guru Ganesha mentioned before, um, you know, f- for us as musicians, there's, there's really no other way for me to get higher, <laughs> literally, mm-hmm. you know, feel a, an, a complete sense of total elation and surrender than when I'm doing music. And there is a quality to music that is focalized in, in, in touching the higher realms that also does something particular. Now, I'm just going to start by saying I love all kinds of music. I love country music. I love really intense electronic music. I love pop music. I love all kinds of music. I enjoy them all. But there's a quality to what we're going to refer to as devotional music mm-hmm. that, that for me personally, I can only speak from my own experience, just has this next sort of level of a quality of, of it bringing a sense of elation and peace and just total joy and surrender. So because I was seeking all of these, you know, seeking and, and trying to figure out all of these, you know, which path I wanted to take, it kind of naturally led me to, to devotional music. And so I would say that's really my, that's really my spiritual path is, is through music and through devotional music. And, and now at this stage, it's really through sharing that is, is part of my path. Also, it's not only just doing it for myself and chanting and, and what have you learning all this music, but part of the joy of my spiritual path is, is also giving that to other people and letting other people experience that and learn about that. That's equally as that brings me an equal sense, if not more joy and elation while doing the music. And uh, Ganesha, tell me about the pre-Sufi life. You mean... Uh, from a spiritual standpoint. In other words, where were you coming from, if you want to even use the word religiously? Oh, yeah, well, my father was Russian Jewish. My mother was Irish Catholic. I, I like to joke, this is what happens when you mix a Jew and a Catholic. You know? <laughs> <laughs> they warned you about that. And, um, but... Um, you know, they, they never quite agreed on how to raise me. I mean, my father's family was more predominant in my life, so I ended up in synagogue a little bit more than I did in church. But my mother always said, son, when you're 18, wink, wink, you can choose your own path in life. So, well, when I was 18 and 19, well, first off, at 18, I was at Woodstock. And then, uh, you know, then I'm in a rock and roll band, and then... Um, I met this guru from India, and I'm practicing yoga and meditation every day and feeling, wow, I mean, the kundalini yoga that Yogi Bhajan taught got me as high as any, you know, psychedelic drug did. So I gave up all the, the drugs and everything. And at age 22, I kind of embraced the Sikh path, which is, and, and Yogi Bhajan, who happened to be a Sikh from northern, and like the prime minister of India is of the Sikh religion. He didn't come here to teach religion. He came here. He was a master of Kundalini Yoga and meditation, but he happened to be of the Sikh religion. I got interested in it. It preaches oneness, you know, and and it it, it comes out of a whole uh, 
anti-caste system mo- movement that started in India four or five hundred years ago. And he was like the leader of that, saying, there, hey, there's no high, no low. We're all one. And he forced kings to sit with beggars and eat it, you know, together on the floor. And all. I mean, it was just it was very inspiring, the whole teachings. So at 22, I donned a turban and started to grow a little beard, and I went home. And my mother freaked out when she saw me, you know. I said, Ma, I thought you said when I was 18 I could choose my own path. She said, well, I didn't mean this. <laughs> she said, I said, well, what did you mean? She said, well, I thought you'd be a Catholic. <laughs> I said, well, why did you think I would be a Catholic? You know, you, you've been compl- you were in a convent as a kid. You've been compl- you complained about the nuns. You've been complaining about the church my entire life, right on up to the Pope. Mm. She said, yeah, but it's better than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I, you know, that was my background. But then she, you know, two years later, I came home from uh, for Thanksgiving meal, and she's all dressed in white with a white kind of like Gloria Swanson turban, the movie star, with a leg and emerald up there. Because, you know, we at the time, we were all wearing white flowing clothes and everything, and turbans. And, and I said, Ma, what's happening? She says, I... I said, did you become a Sikh? She said, no, 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 no. I just wanted to pay tribute to your path. And I said, really? And she had made this all vegetarian meal, tofu, turkey, and everything. Mm-hmm. I said, really? And I said, why? She said, well, it got you off drugs. Mm-hmm. You know, and then I said to her, I said, well, how did you know I was on drugs? <laughs> <laughs> she said, a mother always knows. <laughs> That, that must have been astounding. And mothers always seem to surprise us, uh, mine included, as, as made comments to me uh, about my life and past when we're sitting chatting on over the phone. Right. So, yeah, mothers are quite astounding. As a matter of fact, that kind of leads me, we're going to kind of go back to the 13 grandmothers in terms of the whole matriarchal aspect. Now, I was born and raised in a family of eight, four sisters, two older, two younger, and of course, the mother. And then it was so it was me and my brother and my dad who were outnumbered. Right. And I've after seeing this, these videos and learning more about these women. And I've said this before, I would have no problem living in a matriarchal, matriarchal mm-hmm. society. And I asked this question and I kind of put this to, to the two of you. Isn't it sort of true? And I don't want to be stereotypical. I, I sort of mean this in a serious sense that women have sort of been controlling and, and, and calling the shots in our civilization and families and societies for, for generations anyway. I mean, we, we not again, the stereotypical thing is, you know, that a woman will give a man a look. If it's the husband, she looks at him a certain way and he's okay. kind of thing, but she's always been the nurturer, the supporter, the encourager and so forth. So how do these 13 women or what role do you see them playing in our present and future? Well, I hope that they, that they play a great role in our present and our future. And the reason for that is, you know, as, as much as that is true, what you say that, you know, women on some level, they have great influence, let's say over men. Um, On the other hand, I feel like, you know, there's a lot of fairly atrocious things happening in the world right now that I'm not even going to, get into, but war being the least, Mm -hmm. the least of them. And I feel like women just have a a more, we naturally have kind of a more of a peaceful sort of nurturing. Mm -hmm. It's easier for us. I feel to see things as a whole, to care about, to care about everyone, to kind of find that, that, that place of compassion for pretty much any being, because that's what a mother does. Um, so I feel like that's what the 13 grandmothers, that's what they represent. That's what they're really trying to bring back into the world. And, you know, not so much a a matriarchal society as much as just bringing the, the energy of the matriarch, bringing the energy of the feminine, giving it a, a bit more of a bigger presence than there is right now, because as much as I, I would love to believe that, that women have a bit, have a bit more of an influence on things. I feel that it, if, if we really delved deep, it's probably a little bit more out of balance, the other direction in, in that way right now. Mm-hmm. So um, my personal hope for, 
the grandmothers, for all grandmothers, for all mothers, for all daughters, for all the women, is that, you know, through this time that that all of us can step up a little bit more into that place and, and know our strength and our power and our not a, not in a strength and a power in um in a in an intense controlling violent way but our power within the gentleness you know and what that could really do to to help our planet mm-hmm. really what are your impressions well you know men have been the primary political leaders for many centuries and we certainly made a mess of that and uh <laughs> I think if you could visualize, uh, you know, a table with the, you know, where the the majority of the leaders, political leaders, were women, and there was a discussion about, you know, you know, uh, what do we do with the planet as is right now? I think it would be very unlikely that the decision would be to be drop more bombs on each other, you know, because no one understands the pain. Uh, you know, when a when a, a a child is killed or maimed by a bomb, no one under no one understands that pain like a mother. Mm-hmm. Certainly, no man. I mean, we you know we're in pain if our child is killed or hurt, but the mother has there's a depth of the agony that she feels. You know that no man even understands. It's like childbirth too. So I just think we need more of that experience and wisdom helping to shape where this whole planet is going, you know, and I think 13 grand, grandmothers are really, you know, potentially could be helped leading that charge, you know. Well, we're certainly on board in that respect, that, that changes need to be made and we need to be part of those changes as well. <laughs> 